Great. Let's start right away. Okay, so we'll start with some breathing meditation. And then as your object of refuge, visualize Buddha Shakyamuni in the space in front of you. Being inseparable from your lama or your lamas. Manifesting all the enlightened qualities we can attain ourselves. While appearing as a monk, a fully ordained monk. With a body made of radiant light. Passionately gazing at us and all sentient beings who surround us. So things are all around you, or all sentient beings, with especially those we have a hard time with as we usually try to avoid right in front of us. And then let's remember that ultimately there is no inherent mind, there is no objective mind, no mind that exists by way of its own character. And conventionally, in terms of its nature, being clear and knowing, Our minds don't really differ from those of sentient beings. With our differences being very superficial. So based on that understanding, generate the same sense of deep care you have for yourself, for each and every sentient being. A feeling of closeness. Affection. in the form of the mind that's called affectionate love. Great. 
considering all sentient beings to be important and precious. Even those we don't like. And that feeling of closeness, that affectionate love, then gives way to great compassion, focusing on the endless suffering sentient beings continuously endure, and wishing for each and every sentient being to be totally free from any unwanted experience and its causes. And that wishes to be able to protect sentient beings from these experiences and their causes. giving then way to the altruistic attitude that is determined to do whatever is necessary to take on personal responsibility towards helping sentient beings to overcome suffering and its causes. And since that is only really possible once we become Buddhas ourselves, let's generate the sincere, the heartfelt wish or even determination to become fully enlightened for the benefit of each and every sentient being. And it's with that mind that we'll continue to study Nagarjuna's text. That is the motivation for our study of the fundamental wisdom. And so let's deepen that determination by reciting the prayer. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Okay. Now, as usual, we start with a lum room to reflect on some of the topics here that very much relate to. Oh, wait, um, I haven't done it right. I have to first go to the. Okay. Here we are. Can you see the, the the outlines? Are they appearing on the screen? Great. 
Okay. Thank you. All right. So, of course, as part of our study of the fundamental wisdom, we need to understand how it all fits together with the Lamrim. In fact, there's not, not a single topic that doesn't somehow fit or doesn't somehow belong to the Lamrim or that isn't connected to the Lamrim. So, last time we spoke about we started to talk about the causal, causes for the arisal of the afflictions. And that's something to continue to reflect on, but of course, based again on our own afflictions. So to take some time, reflect on what are my strongest afflictions? What are the destructive emotions that I have the hardest time with that arise the most uh, frequently, that are the, that are the strongest? And also be aware of the different causes, of course. Now, last time we spoke about the cause of having the seeds, having the potential for those to arise. Okay, so as long as we don't realize emptiness directly, we don't start to remove these seeds. Now, that's really important. Just realizing emptiness directly doesn't mean we are liberated, but we start to eliminate what are called the seeds or the potential of some of the coarser afflictions, at least, uh, to eliminate, to, we start to eliminate them. So on the path of seeing, that would be the first time you realize emptiness directly. And at that point, you then start to eliminate the potential for certain afflictions to arise, especially the acquired, the intellectually acquired afflictions. Anyway, so those are the seats. But those Seeds are not the only thing that is responsible for the affliction. So if right now we have no afflictions and suddenly very strong attachment arises, seems out of the blue. Well, it's not out of the blue because the seed of that attachment arises there. And then there are the objects that stimulate, they stimulate um, the arising of um, the arising of certain attachments. So certain objects. When you encounter these objects, anger arises. I mean, we all know that with certain people that uh, for some reason, when we just see them, they lead to a feeling of resentment, even anger and aggression, hatred and so forth. Or in the case of attachment, uh, jealousy, envy and so forth. So these objects, um, and so they do rise, well, because there are the, the seeds, the object is somewhere nearby. And we often have wrong views in relation to the object that we don't really question. They just rise. And then based on these wrong views, this person will give me lasting happiness. If I just got rid of this person, all my problems will be solved and so forth. So that's another cause. I spoke about it last time, which is why sometimes it's not a bad idea to just avoid the object. Temporarily, it doesn't mean we should forever, we have to forever avoid a certain object. Of course not. But for instance, the situation of monks and nuns is such that as monks and nuns or as nuns, we, we avoid or having certain vows, we avoid certain situations until at some point it doesn't matter whether we encounter them or not. But we stay away from certain activities because they may stimulate, they may uh, give rise to to certain afflictions and it's advised in certain cases of a person always triggers anger in us for instance to just stay away anyway so it's the objects that stimulate the afflictions and then there's the detrimental influence having wrong friends having uh friends that influence us influence us in a in a negative way like social distractions um spending time with them i mean there's no well, it's no problem with spending time with people. We shouldn't necessarily, I mean, avoid if it's uh, harmful to them, if it's hurtful to these friends. So to to totally ignore them, that's not what's meant here. But to not allow ourselves to come under the influence of certain friends. And again, it requires some reflections. Is that the case or not? And then you have a variable uh, stimuli, like stimuli so certain explanations that uh first for instance following certain teachings or reading material 
that may lead our mind in the wrong directions. So to avoid, I mean, maybe also, I mean, certain movies possibly that promote violence, for instance, or certain books that lead to a violent kind of, or that depict a violent behavior, which may trigger something within us, for instance, or certain books and movies, etc., that uh, trigger attachment. So certain stimuli. Uh, but here in particular, it's verbal. It's verbal stimuli. And then there are habits. We've got so many habits. So to watch out our habits, sometimes they're also called imprints. It's another way of describing imprints. Like imprints, the imprints of our afflictions are a type of habit. So therefore to break these habits by generate by developing new habits. So oftentimes, if we're really angry with a particular person, every time we meet this person, whenever there's resentment towards this person, well, now we need to habituate ourselves with an antidote to that anger, for instance. Well, in the form of love, compassion, and so forth. Uh, trying to understand the person, where are they coming from, why are they acting the way they act, putting ourselves into their shoes as best as we can. So to pay extra attention to the habits, because most of our afflictions arise out of habits. I mean, because we're so familiar with them. Attachment, of course, same idea. Certain people trigger attachment in us just simply because we're so used to it. And these habits, this familiarity with these particular afflictions, that needs to be counteracted because the more we give in our afflictive emotions, the stronger these habits. And so the sixth, then the sixth cause that um, is that gives rise to the afflictions is um, inappropriate attention. So it's not really contradictory to some of the other points, but that we pay a special attention to certain things. So special attention to the attractiveness of an object or the unpleasant qualities of an object. Uh, paying attention to something like when we are, like for instance, um, physical desire for another person. So to pay attention to the what we consider to be a pure body in the moment of desire, seeing it as pure as faultless and so forth. Um, so basically, it's like these wrong views that arise, but we we pay special attention to these uh, aspects. So these aspects that lead to the wrong views, that trigger these wrong views, and of course that trigger the um, the afflictions. So these six, these six causes we need to really look out for, um, especially the last five. I mean, the first one is already there. There's not much you can do unless you realize emptiness directly. Um, so be aware that it's there. But then with the other ones, we can make an effort to, well, avoid certain objects when they are particular afflictions that are the strongest in our mind, that give us a hard time, that prevent us from practicing the Dharma and so forth, well, make a point in either applying the antidotes to these objects or maybe temporarily, if it's too overwhelming, avoiding them. Avoiding wrong friends, or at least their influence. Avoiding stimuli, verbal stimuli, whether it be through books or conversations or well, maybe the news that upset us every time, uh, get us really angry. Well, maybe for the time being, avoid these really extensive news that trigger that aggression in us. Habit, of course, to work, to make sure or to, to become aware, what are my strongest habits which habits do I need to break or need to weaken at least? And what is this wrong attention that I'm giving to certain objects? What am I focusing on, which then gives rise to the different afflictive emotions? What is this yeah, attention directed at? Okay. So if it's a person we really don't like, we focus totally on their negative qualities. We don't give it the time, for instance, to focus on their good qualities. Or if I'm terribly attached to a person, well, I don't see the whole picture. I pay attention to the good qualities, but 
I need to also pay attention to the negative qualities and get a fuller sense of who this person is that to my mind is so perfect and so forth. All right. Now that's about the lumrim. Um, and then we'll have some questions. Actually, I, I mentioned last time I talked about a question by someone who had asked me in private. Um, oops. Okay, I've prepared a little handout. I didn't have the time to send it off because, yeah, uh, that's also the reason I was late. Um, this person asks particular, specifically about something I said a few a few weeks ago. I talked about the fact that if phenomena exist inherently, for instance, being different from something else, the cause is different from the result. Well, being different, if being different exists inherently, then the cause and the effect have to exist at the same time. Because how can you have something in, in, in a particular moment that is different from something else if that something else doesn't exist? So in that context, I also mentioned that some people, when they hear that all phenomena are merely labeled, they or they hear that from a Buddhist point of view, phenomena only exist because there's a labeling mind. Their thought, the, the 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 idea that arises in their mind is well, since the mind is needed to label, since there's this labeling mind, without which phenomena don't exist, does that mean when if there's no mind to label a particular object at a particular time, does that mean the object doesn't exist? So in other words the way they describe it's like the objects are created by the mind it's like unless you have a thought about something the thing doesn't exist and that is based on an understanding or that is based on the wrong view that labeling exists inherently that labeling exists inherently that there's this absolute labeling that takes place and because there's this absolute labeling therefore unless you have some labeling mind you cannot have you cannot have an object totally forgetting of course that well labeling is not a, it's not a it's not a sense of creation kind of creating something out of nothing you need of course a basis of labeling a basis of designation first of all you need to have a mind that labels. You need to have the label itself. So whether you label it, I don't know, cat or dog or walking, arising, whatever label you apply, you need that label. You need the mind that labels and you need a basis based on which you label, the basis of labeling or basis of imputation. Okay, so therefore there's no absolute well therefore labeling in itself is not just creating something out of nothing that's really important but also labeling itself doesn't exist inherently it is also merely labeled so on the basis here i can use this picture although it's meant for something else as well well on the basis of someone and here, here, this is a very typical way of describing, of course, the brain is like, I mean, like, that's if the mind was the brain and so forth. No, it's just, um, that's not supposed to represent the mind, of course. But anyway, um, based on our different thoughts, and I didn't have the time to add more thoughts, so I just left them blank. But the point is, based on having these different thoughts, we say the person labels, of course, on the basis of, you, you know, like the basis of invitation, uh, independent, dependence on the label itself and the mind and so forth. Independence on all those. If there's the thought, it is such and such, then we label the person just labeled. It's a little irritating with these, these two words. So labeling that the person has just labeled. Okay, so even the labeling process, that's not an absolute, doesn't exist absolutely. It is also 
just a conventional, or it exists merely conventionally. It is merely labeled. And labeling doesn't have to, if you label something, it doesn't have to exist in that moment. It can exist in the past. Now here I took the example of uh, something like a person who has posthumously, posthumously uh, labeled to be the Dalai Lama. So be, you may be aware of that. Uh, of the 14 Dalai Lamas, it was only at the time of the third Dalai Lama, um, by a, at the time of a, 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 a Mongolian king, if you like, a Khan called Altan Khan, he encountered the third Dalai Lama, Sonam Gyatso, um, and only so the first Dalai Lama was called Gendundrup. He was a disciple of Lama Tsongkhapa's. The second was called uh, Gendun Gyatso and Sunam Gyatso. Yeah. So the second was called Gendun Gyatso. He was not called the Dalai Lama while he was alive. The first one wasn't called the Dalai Lama when he was alive. So only during the third Dalai Lama did this particular Mongolian king, Altan Khan, did he say, well, this particular person, Sonam Gyatso, he's such an amazing lama, such an amazing being, and we're aware of the previous incarnations. So since we're aware of the previous two, posthumously, he was then called, the first one was called the first Dalai Lama, the second was called the second, and then during the time of Sonam Gyatso, the third Dalai Lama, he was called the third Dalai Lama. So actually, while Gendundrup, who was Lama Tsongkhapa's disciple, Oh, I forgot to actually na add his name. Lama Tsongkhapa's disciple. I should put Gendundrup. Sorry, I was in such a rush. So Lama Tsongkhapa's disciple, Gendundrup. This should go here. Gendundrup was the first Dalai Lama. Lama Tsongkhapa's. So that thought, that thought was labeling the first Dalai Lama, Gendundrup, to be Dalai Lama. Or labeled him as first Dalai Lama. So Altan Khan probably had the, the thought first and then he made it publicly known. And anyway, posthumously, he was called the first Dalai Lama. But he wasn't at the time when he was around. No one called him that. So you can label right now in the present, you can label an object that has existed, that no longer exists, but can still be called, even if it wasn't that called that in the past, it is called that now, and it exists as that now, or it can be said to, or it doesn't exist. It's not like Gawag and Ndrub existed, exists in the present, for instance, but it's correct to say that he was the first Dalai Lama. Um, likewise, in the future, you label someone here, my future son's name will be Tom. So already the, the, the this future son doesn't exist yet, but already the label has been given. So there's no fault in saying that. So you don't have to have that child to, to, to give the label. And then here you have the present. Jane is a student. Um, and that way, just having the thought on the basis, of course, on the basis, on a correct basis of uh, invitation. This needs to be stressed again and again. We don't call something a cow today and a dog tomorrow just because we feel like it. No. There are certain rules to it, that there's a certain basis of designation, certain characteristics that we, uh, we, we impute on an object, or no, we consider to be the defining characteristics of that object. And based on that, then we say it is a cow, for instance, or Jane is a student. So what does it mean to be a student? That should be clear. And then we label on the basis of that. It is this, it is that, it is not this, it is not that. All these thoughts are labeling thoughts. But if we look for that which we label, if we search for it among the basis of imputation, the parts, the basis of imputation, now it's parts. On the basis of those parts, if we look for the student within Jane, the Dalai Lama within the Lama Tsongkhapa's disciple, Gyanundrup, or the Tom being Tom, in on the basis of this future these future aggregates of this future child we won't find it so it's merely labeled 
However, as I said, it can happen in, in all three times in, in at any time. So we can label the past, present, and future. But if we have a sense there's an absolute labeling, everything is just there because we label it, and that labeling is absolutely there and it's true, then, well, if no one is labeling the room next door, it can't exist. It's not like that. That is that considers that that thought if that thought arises then it arises on the basis of a view of an absolute labeling an absolute designation of objects but that is merely labeled as well this process of just having these thoughts having these thoughts on the basis of imputation and so forth um, we label labeling okay so i hope that's a little clearer at least well, definitely for the person who asked the question. Okay, so I'll, yeah, so again, I made a mistake here, left out Lama Tsongkhapa. It's not, of course, not every disciple of Lama Tsongkhapa was the first Dalai Lama. So it's, it's Gendundrup, his name was Gendundrup. I'll add that and then send you the updated handout. And as I said, I haven't sent it out yet. Okay, that's that question. And B also had three questions actually well it's one question but divide it into three um it's, it's she says you mentioned that ceasing happens because the impermanent object is progressing towards its non-existence does this happen because the production of the object is contaminated with causes and conditions that are contaminated karma and afflictions no no um well, for instance, the mind is contaminated with, or a Buddha's mind is, con is is not contaminated with causes and conditions, and still a Buddha's mind is is said to cease. All right, now this is a little tricky, and I'm glad she asked this question because when we say it's progressing towards its non-existence, well, your argument may be, what about a Buddha's mind? How could a Buddha's mind be ceasing moment by moment if it always continues on, if it always exists? So first of all, just because something is, well, of course, if it's, if it's the, if something is contaminated with causes and conditions, it definitely ceases because it must be impermanent and whatever is impermanent. So something that is contaminated with causes and conditions, or contaminated by causes and conditions, contaminated due to certain causes and conditions, such as karma and afflictions, well, it's an impermanent phenomenon and therefore it ceases. Okay. But to, in order to cease, to cease, it doesn't have to be contaminated with causes and conditions. Okay. Now, what does it mean to near its own or progressing towards its non-existence? Well, think that even the mind of a Buddha is made up of many, many different moments. And the first moment gives rise to the next moment. And the next moment gives rise to its next moment and so forth. So each moment is slightly different. Now, you may wonder, different? Like a Buddha's mind? A Buddha's mind's qualities don't increase or decrease the qualities. There's no improvement or 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 the opposite, that degeneration of any kind of positive qualities. There's no weakening of positive qualities. However, we still say that a Buddha's mind changes. Well, then you may wonder, well, why does the Buddha's mind change if the Buddha's mind in each moment realizes all phenomena? Yes, that is true. Realizes all phenomena, past, present, and future, past, present, and future, simultaneously. However, yesterday's, I don't know, yesterday's object. So the Buddha today, like let's say yesterday, I don't know, yesterday there was some event, uh, a birthday party. So, so just bizarrely and just a weird example I mean any kind of example I mean the Buddha realizes everything so the Buddha realizes the birthday party yesterday I mean today the Buddha realizes the birthday party knows this birthday party or let's say give you another example I accumulate the karma of getting really angry so no I, I accumulate not I, I generate I, I, I get really really angry yesterday so the Buddha knows yesterday 
that uh, that I get angry yesterday is yesterday it's in the present for the Buddha he knows today that I got really really angry and the day before yesterday he also knew that I was getting really angry yesterday so he he knew that I was going to become really angry yesterday so the day before yesterday the Buddha knew that so in that sense at all three times the Buddha knew that yesterday I got really angry. However, when he knew the day before yesterday that I was going to get angry yesterday, he knew that this was in the future. So this was a future event. Me getting angry, the mind, Buddha's mind, realizing me getting angry was realized by the Buddha as a future event. Me getting really angry yesterday, the Buddha realized that yesterday as a present event. And today the Buddha realizes it as a past event. So the mind has changed because the objects have changed. So that which was yesterday, the present, is today, the past. And that which was the day before yesterday, the future, is now the past and was yesterday, the past. So in that sense, um, no, sorry, was yesterday the present anyway. I hope you understand what I mean. So um, I, I don't want to confuse you too much. But the point is that the Buddha's mind perceives all phenomena simultaneously, all phenomena at the same time. But being a phenomena at a certain time, at a certain time it's the present, at a certain time it's the future. And the Buddha realizes those as the present, as the future, as the past. And since Phenomena are not the same. They're not always the present. They're not always the past or they're not always the future and so forth. Therefore, in that respect, we can definitely say that the Buddha's mind changes. Just from the point of view of these objects. Although they're not the same changes as in our case. Sometimes better, sometimes worse. Sometimes they're angry, sometimes not angry. No, as I said, the Buddha's qualities do not degenerate. So, having said all this, how can we say that the Buddha's mind ceases? Well, yesterday's mind stops to be, or it ceases to be, or ceases, ceases to be yesterday's mind. So, today, it has become today's mind. It ceased to be yesterday's mind, and so forth. Therefore, since it consists of different moments, and each moment ceases, we say Buddha's mind, the Buddha's mind ceases with each moment giving rise to the next moment, to the next moment and so forth. So you don't need, you don't need any afflictions and karma and so forth. You don't need degeneration. You don't need improvement. No, here the changes are just the fact that a previous moment is not, that, that the present moment is not the previous moment and the future moment is not the present moment and so forth. So that there's this constant uh, coming into existence of new moments. Yeah, I hope I answered that. I hope that's clear now. How then do we account for the momentary changing or seizing of an Arya Buddha? I just answered that. So, uh, who of course is not progressing towards uh, its own non-existence. No, but still, each moment is different. A mind is an active, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a static phenomenon, it's changing all the time, and therefore each moment is ceasing in order to give rise to the next moment. It ceases to give rise to the future or next moment. Okay, uh, and then she mentions Mipam's, uh, she actually posted a book here, where is it? Oh, yeah, here. It's this book by Mirpam Rinpoche, by Mirpam Gatso, Fundamental Mind, The Nigma View of the Great Completeness. So in this book, um, she says, Mirpam pos posits a fundamental mind that is uncompounded and permanent when one realizes directly the ultimate truth. So there's this fundamental mind, that mind that realizes the ultimate nature of phenomena. So when we hear uncompounded and permanent, this naturally sounds nonsensical to me. Um, until I heard a Nyingma teacher explain that permanent here means not degenerating. Yes, 
the word permanent is sometimes used in certain contexts and not just in the Nyingma tradition. Also, sometimes in the in the Gelug tradition, sometimes it says like he will, I will always, I will always do such and I will permanently do such and such. I mean, it's the word for permanent is used. We would not translate it as permanently, we would translate it as always, but it's really saying I I will oh I will permanently do such and such, which is not saying that it doesn't change moment by moment, but that you will continue to do the same thing. Or the Buddha's mind is permanent. Here in this context, uh, yes, as as B says, it means it doesn't lose its positive qualities. It no longer degenerates. Yeah, so the word is just sometimes used in a different context. And as I said, in, in the other traditions, in the Galuk tradition, also you find that that usage of the word sometimes. So it always depends in, in on the context. Okay, so here it does not mean degenerate. So the Buddha's mind changes moment by moment, but it's called permanent. It's described as permanent because it doesn't degenerate. Uh, so I suppose this is one way to get out of Arya Buddha's not degenerating. Uh, no, they don't degenerate. They don't degenerate exactly. A Buddha doesn't degenerate. An, an Arya Buddha, and she uses the uh, the right kind of terminology, like in Tibetan. Also, an Arya Buddha refers to the person, him or herself, a Buddha, him or herself, and a and and, and this person, Buddha, is impermanent. Buddha's mind, uh, the Buddha as a person, they are impermanent. There are certain qualities of a Buddha that are called Buddha or awakened one, like as an awakened qualities, and they're also permanent ones. Here, permanent in the sense they don't change moment by moment. For instance, the Buddha's elimination of obstructions, just the cessation of afflictions in the continuum of a Buddha. That is not changing moment by moment. That's just the absence of something having been eliminated, having existed previously, and now having been eliminated, that elimination of uh, these obscurations, those are said to be Buddha. The, the word Buddha is used actually in Tibetan or in Sanskrit as like an awakened quality, but it's not a person. So usually when we use the word Buddha, we use it to refer to the person. But in Tibetan or in Sanskrit, Buddha can also mean any quality of a Buddha, any any cessation in the continuum of a Buddha, uh, for instance, the mind, the body, all these are also described as awakened or as Buddhas, right? So it's a little weird way of speaking. In English, you wouldn't say the Buddha's mind is Buddha or the Buddha's foot is Buddha. But in Tibetan, it, it's definitely used that way. Anyways, so to then differentiate between a quality of a Buddha, which is called a, a that which is awakened or Buddha uh, versus the person Buddha, the word Arya Buddha is is added. So Arya Buddha always you always know in Tibetan then, oh that refers to um, you, that refers to the person Buddha. Anyway, having said all this, mm, yeah. So uh, a Buddha as a person, an Arya Buddha does not degenerate but changes moment by moment because the mind changes moment by moment. And the reason for why the mind changes moment by moment, although it realizes all phenomena at all times, is the reason I gave early on that an object, the, real, the Buddha realizes, first realizes as a future object, then realizes it as a present object, and then realizes it as a past object. And there is a change. Okay. Yes. So... These are the questions for today. There was one more question I was asked. Um, I guess it's in the context of Jimmy's question on true existence. He had in his last, the last questions he asked last time was on true existence. Um, and so I'll go into this more next time. I want to say a little bit about true existence versus inherent existence. They mean the same thing but they're slightly differently explained. So I'll say a little bit about more about this next time. Okay, there's just not enough time today. All right, let's go back to the text. Oh, where do I have the text? Oh, here. And out. Yeah, here we go. Now, as you remember, 
We've had quite, we've spent quite some time on uh, questions, but well, sometimes that's definitely helpful um, just to fill in some of the blanks. But then let's continue with what we got to last time. So this is all connected to the fourth verse, verse number four. Um, in this context, sorry, I have to scroll down. I, I was in the right spot. Um, okay. So in this context, I've read through this part, we were dealing with a particular non-Buddhist school. And like I said, it's not for their sake. This non-Buddhist school, they, the followers of that school, probably not going to read this material. So it's not directed at them. It's directed at our own sense of reality. So sometimes it seems... We may not even recognize we have these wrong views. Sometimes it's just helpful. Here it's like giving, separating out this arising, uh, giving us the opportunity to look at it in a separate way. And actually, remember last time I spoke about this, I said there are these grammarians, like this particular non-Buddhist school called the grammarians. So they would say um, that... These three causes of an eye consciousness, the immediately preceding condition, the dominant condition, and the observed condition, they first give rise to the arising, to the coming into existence of the eye consciousness. So these are the these three are the causes of that activity, and that activity then in turn gives rise to the eye consciousness. Okay. Now, I think if we heard it often enough, it would kind of make sense. And of course, the analogy here that is given is of cooking rice. You need a person, a container, water, and so forth. And then it's the boiling. That is the cause of the cooked rice. Of course, at that time, you still need the person. Well, the person, not necessarily, but the container, the water, you still have those and they exist at the same time. So really, they would exist simultaneously. But as I said, it may be helpful to just separately describe this activity to understand it better and also to avoid wrong views. I mean, maybe we don't have this wrong view at this point, but we may take it on at some point. It's also possible. I mean, it's this whole process. Let's be realistic. Our life right now is controlled not just by one wrong view, the misapprehension of reality, by countless wrong views, countless wrong views. There is no limit to the wrong views that arise in our mind. And many of them we're not aware of. Many of these views, we have no idea they, they exist. We're so focused on whatever is the object of those wrong views, we never realize it's a wrong view. And then based on our giving attention to these objects, then all sorts of afflictions arise. Therefore, it's important, although they're maybe not as stressed as much as the root ignorance, that from within this root ignorance, it gives rise to endless wrong views. And I'm pretty sure we will have that experience how oftentimes just in everyday life we misunderstand, we think it's like this and it's actually not like that. But those are like just not knowing and getting it totally wrong. But of course, perceiving that which is impermanent to be permanent. And again, it's not on an intellectual level. If I were to ask you, is it permanent? Is it impermanent? You would probably say it's impermanent. But there are certain minds that just pop up. You know, like, think in each second, you can have three or four thoughts, one after the other. Our mind is so quick. So while we're just having these thoughts, one after the other, one after the other, there are wrong views, there are correct views, they all come into this mixture, mixture in the sense of like arising one after the other. And some wrong views give rise to this affliction, to another affliction, to actions that harm us. It's so complicated. It's so complicated. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering, I'm not sure this is true, but at this day and age where everything is much faster, whether we don't accumulate non-virtue even faster than before. You know what I mean? Because it's like our thoughts 
I guess we we our thoughts are faster. We have to plan ahead in the day, and everything is faster and faster. So there are a lot more thoughts arising I, I i would imagine there's less attentiveness because if it's too fast how can you pay attention we're stressed out already as it is and so there's a lot of known virtue we accumulate we're just not aware of and the part of buddhist practice one of the first steps is really to slow down i mean it's impossible to be mindful if it's too fast and how do you slow down to remove some of the distractions simpler to live a simpler life with less distractions and yeah so in that way the first step is to become aware of these endless wrong views but as i said with these grammarians we may have already such a wrong view or we may generate this wrong view as part of our buddhist practice <laughs> that's the next thing when we learn about these different ideas. I mean, we never thought about emptiness and so forth before we met the Dharma, I guess. Um, most of us didn't. But then when we encounter these views, then maybe new wrong views arise that we didn't have previously, which is fine. It's just part of the process. And eventually we'll hope to overcome them. But let's not underestimate our tendency to have all these wrong views. Anyway, having said all this, so here, this is for our own sake, this view of the Vigomarian is, this this assertion is, is set forth for our own sake, in order to help us to better understand, uh, well, emptiness. So, anyway, having said, having presented this assertion that first you have the three conditions in the case of consciousness, or let's take the classic example, you have the seed and the sprout. No, you have the seed, you have the fertilizer, you have water, those three coming together. Then according to the grammarians, there's the arising of the seed, the arising, and then only the seed. That doesn't make sense. We've heard it wouldn't make sense because then you will have a time when the conditions, all the causes and conditions are there, but there's no rising. And then you have a time when there's the rising, but there are no causes and conditions because they, are, they arise one after the other. Also, you would have that absurdity that something in, interferes between something there's something interferes between the three causes and the eye consciousness which is the arising there's something in between there's a moment in between and again that doesn't make sense so as described in this paragraph i, I think i read this uh two weeks ago so i don't think, think i need to read it again but this is what lama tsongkhapa this is lama tsongkhapa's argument um in his ocean of reasoning he presents exactly these the first reasoning towards the beginning of this passage and then the last reasoning more towards the end. Oh, no, here, this reasoning more towards the end of this passage. So anyway, it doesn't make sense that they don't exist at the same time. Um, arising is not produced by the three and so forth. Okay, so I, I think I got to here. All right, so the three conditions and the arising of consciousness, they exist simultaneously and directly give rise to consciousness. It is important to understand that each of the three conditions of an eye consciousness perceiving a tree, for instance, performs the function of producing that eye consciousness. They all perform that function. The immediately preceding condition, the eye sense faculty, and the observed condition, the tree, each give rise to the eye consciousness perceiving the tree. Remember, that's the transitive verb, producing. And since each of the three conditions produce the eye consciousness, each one also facilitates the arising or coming into existence of the eye consciousness. So the cause does something and the effect does something. Okay. In fact, the three conditions, their individual function of producing the eye consciousness and the action of arising of the eye consciousness, which is brought about by the three conditions, they exist simultaneously. They all exist simultaneously. Oh, I did read this last time. Furthermore, the action of arising of a result, the causes and conditions of the result, and the function of the causes and conditions to produce the result, they're all of one nature. So the arising, the causes and conditions, and the, the action of the causes and conditions to produce the result, they're all of one nature. 
So they're merely labeled, of course, but on a valid basis. So I remember Avada said, oh, that's so difficult because I can see the seed, I can see the sprout, but I don't see the arising, right? Yeah, that's true. I mean, the arising is an activity. Well, you don't see in the way you could say if you watch it long enough or the arising of something, if it's if it's fast forward, for instance, or you, you look at it long enough, you will see the arising. Actually, you watch it, right? So it's like the, 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 the seed growing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So you say, I see the arising. Um, we see activities. We see walking of a person we we can see the death of a person um it doesn't happen in one moment of course it requires moments in time but we can watch it and see oh i saw how the seed grew okay well that that of course it, it, it's the c means like you really have to spend a lot of time but um yeah, if you watch long enough, and certain things, of course, they grow faster. So the Tibetan word for arising is also to grow. Um, it just doesn't work as nicely grammatically um, here. Um, so the growth of an eye consciousness sounds w weird anyway. In Tibetan, the word to arise also means to come into existence and depends on causes and conditions, and it also means to grow. Anyway, so you see the seed, the, the, the plant growing, although there's no plant yet. You see the apple tree growing, for instance. So if you watch long oh. enough, you can actually watch it. Yes. So, so you, see, you see the seed and you see the sprout. But even if you uh, look all the time, from the time the seed um, is uh, appearing Planted. Mm -hmm. and everything, you will never be able to pinpoint the exact moment or second or split second when the seed turns into a sprout. No, I agree. But you will also never be able to pinpoint the seed exactly where does it start and where does it end, right? Yeah. I mean, that's true, Vada. You, you're going into more ultimate analysis. So, But just ordinarily, on a conventional level, we would say, oh, I saw this thing growing. I saw, I could, I saw my child growing over the years and so forth. But of course, when is this child no longer a toddler? And when the moment we, we look closer, we no, we no longer, I mean, it's very difficult to apply these terms. Terms. So the moment you look closer is really when you apply ultimate analysis, and then things start to disappear. But just and in, in Tibetan, we're in the in the text. It usually talks about not analyzing without analyzing. So if we don't analyze, yeah, things grow, things things come into existence, and so forth. So even these actions, we can watch them. So actually, the imputing is the. Is, um... The imputing is based on a certain uh, instance when we make the sprout or the seed permanent in order to call it what we call it. Ah, so you're saying like in order, in order, in order for us for, to thing, think of, mm -hmm. in order to to impute it as seed. We need to make it as per we need to make it permanent. Oh, we don't, need, we don't need to make it permanent, but to our mind, yeah, when it well, appears to our mind, yeah, this this especially our of course our conceptual mind, this changing quality of it, no, it doesn't appear to that mind. So yeah. you're right. When you think of the seed, there's just the seed as a frozen in time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now you, you you label it, you have these parts based on which you label seat. So it seems to be frozen in time. It doesn't, you don't get the sense of that constant change. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. I, was, I was thinking the same last, uh, last week when we say emptiness of a table. It's not the emptiness of a table. It's the, it's the, the, the mind emptiness or the, 
it's not a table that has the, amp the emptiness. It's as if I think the, the consciousness that sees or, or imputes or, or whatever the table, there is the emptiness. The emptiness is not within the table. The emptiness is not of the, that's what I, all of no, a no. No, no, no. Of course, you can't separate the table from our mind perceiving the table. So previously, when you said, when we label the seed, for instance, well, it has to appear to our conceptual mind and to our conceptual mind, its impermanence does not appear. With that, I agree. I mean, it doesn't have to become permanent. We don't make it permanent as such, but we're not aware of its impermanent, at least not and permanence, at least not with that particular conceptual mind. Um, but this this thing about the emptiness, I mean, it's the table's emptiness. But the emptiness or the table itself does not exist separate from the mind that perceives it. Yeah. But anyway, let's... Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's continue with this here. But I appreciate the thought, definitely thinking in that direction. So anyway, the action of arising of a result. So they all are of one nature. Here you've got the, the drawing again. So the immediately preceding condition, you have the producing the eye consciousness and therefore you have the arising of it as well. And then the uncommon observed. So these are all one nature in, in with regard to the immediately preceding conditions. So see whether this really makes sense to you that the previous moment of consciousness, it produces the eye consciousness. And due to this happening, therefore, there's also the arising of the eye consciousness. And now those are all of one nature. They're inseparably linked. This, the same is true for the uncommon observed condition. Uh, ah, that's wrong. Sorry, the uncommon dominant. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, you even have someone who edits it and still certain things just get, yeah. Sorry, this is a mistake. It should be the uncommon dominant condition. Um, and then again, you have the process of producing and the process of arising, and the observed condition producing the eye consciousness and the rising of the eye consciousness. And of course, there's so many more causes, really. I mean, everything has so many causes. Uh, but these are the main three causes, and you always have these activities here, these functions that are performed, and those are of one nature for each of these causes. Not saying there's also all, all of one nature. That's not what this means. But these three here, the uncommon dominant condition and its production and its arising, and then with regard to these, these are of one nature, these are of one nature, and these are of one nature. Okay. Please note that arising is an action that has an agent, a phenomenon that performs the action. In Tibetan, this is a really important word. Agent, it sounds like James Bond or something. No, but of course, agent is that which does something. An agent here means something that does something. Um, so it's important to know, to understand um, that there's always there are always these three aspects, and you've heard of those, these three aspects of something that does something, the agent, the object to which something is done, and the activity. Now, you don't always have an object. In the case of arising, it's that, that which arises, it, it's the object itself. There's no difference. So that which arises is the the seat or the eye consciousness in this case, but it also does the arising. So there's it's an, an intransitive verb. It's not a transitive verb um, arising here. The same in English. But as I'm saying, you have that. For instance, when you think of generosity, the person who gives, the object that is given, the object that receives something, and the activity of giving so that they don't exist inherently and so forth. So similar here, it's important to understand all these aspects, the agent, the arising, uh, and if there's an object, of course, the object. But here, arising is an action that has an agent, so a phenomenon that performs the action, in this case, the eye consciousness. While the three conditions produce the eye consciousness, that which is produced, the eye consciousness performs the action of arising. So far, I think it's clear. Just to explain it again, 
The I consciousness is that which arises in dependence on the three conditions. Therefore, the I consciousness and its arising depend on each other as action and agent, even though they do not exist at the same time. Okay, so the I consciousness, of course, only arises a moment later. And still we talk about the arising of the I consciousness, the production of the I consciousness. So they depend on each other, but they don't have to exist at the same time. All right, so that's our own view. That's Nagarjuna's view. Now, returning to the view of the grammarians, not only do these non-Buddhist philosophers maintain that impermanent phenomena are the direct result of the action of arising and not of their causes and conditions, they also hold that arising exists objectively and from its own side. Okay. Now, these grammarians, of course, they... We're still dealing with the inherent existence of activities such as arising. Or well, the inherent existence here, yes, the arising of a result. So not only do they have the sense that the arising happens between the result and between the causes and conditions. So first the causes and conditions, then the arising, and then the result. No, on top of that, of course, they also hold the view that that exists inherently. Uh, regarding this assertion, the assertion that the action of arising exists inherently, the same reasoning that was presented in verse 3 to refute inherent existence can be applied here. Okay, that can be applied here. But there's more reasoning. Okay. Additionally, Nagarjuna presents the following reasoning. And here the fundamental wisdom reads, uh, this is the version by G.J. Garfield. This is the version, that's how I would translate it. So as an alternative translation, action does not have condition. There's no action without conditions and so forth. So here it's very similar. Um, it's not that different. An action has no conditions. There's no action that is without conditions. That which lacks action is no condition, nor do conditions have action. Ooh, it sounds a bit like... I once heard this, and a friend of mine reminded me of this before. Um, you know, you all know of, um, Shakespeare's um, "To be or not to be." That is the question. So the Buddhist response is, "To be yet yet not to be." That is the answer. <laughs> to be yet not to be. That is the answer. <laughs> so this very much reminds me uh, of this this kind of saying that someone came up with. So an action has no conditions. There's no action that is without conditions, like both. It's like with condition, without conditions. That which lacks action is no condition, nor do conditions have action. Okay. Um, it seems contradictory first, but of course it has to be explained. So let's go into this verse. Here, for an action to have conditions or be with conditions, means that the action of arising is dependent on conditions which are responsible for its existence. Okay, to have conditions, to be with conditions, it's very, very difficult. Um, we don't talk in that way. In English, we, we, we don't say that. Tibetan is a little bit more flexible in that way. You understand at some point when you hear it again and again, have conditions, and action has conditions. It's not talking about having its own causes that preceded, that's not what's meant here, that the action of arising, for instance, the action of arising of an eye consciousness, which happens during the time of the causes. So during that time, the eye consciousness arises. So that action, um, that action of arising, sorry, I just need to scroll down again. It has conditions. It means that the action of arising is dependent on conditions which are responsible for its existence. So for the arising to take place at the same time, so for instance, at the time of the, 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 the seed, at the time of the seed, the sprout is arising, but you need the this, this seed. So it's dependent on that seed to do that. An example here is the arising of an eye consciousness that is dependent on the three conditions of the eye consciousness. For conditions to have action means that conditions such as the three conditions of the eye consciousness are responsible for the action of arising. Yeshima, so yeah. 
I yes. it for you because uh, the time is ah. Uh, <laughs> <sighs> yes, thank you. I was going to finish that first, and then we have something to meditate on. Okay, never mind. We can still. Great. Thank you for reminding me. I hope people can still follow me. I mean, this is a little bit difficult here, but hopefully if you've done some reading in advance, it makes a little bit more sense. So anyway, we're still with having arisen and rising and so forth. Uh, but next time I'll go into this reasoning and this is really potent here, but we didn't make it. Okay, let's do some meditation on the parts that we have gone through just to deepen them a little and as always we start with some breathing meditation so just be in the present just watch your movement of the breath And then let's make an effort to turn inwards. And get a sense of the fact that our mind, that is our thoughts, constantly changing, arising, ceasing, with new ones arising and ceasing. But due to the fast pace the modern times. This process being faster than it was a hundred or two hundred years ago. So many wrong views. Affecting our thoughts. Giving rise to other afflictions. and to karmic actions. Creating continuous future experiences. Many of them that are unwanted. We have such little control. It 
over the experiences we'll have in the future. is why it's so important to gain more control. So that we're able to generate experiences in the future. They're pleasant more importantly, help us in our progress on the path. And for that, we need emptiness. We need to understand that phenomena don't exist the way they constantly appear to our mind. need to break through our mind holding on to these appearances as being in accordance with reality. So let's pay closer attention to how conventionally, for instance, an eye consciousness comes into existence. while being aware that all that is merely labeled. So think of that in your own continuum, an eye consciousness perceiving a tree arises. What gave rise to that eye consciousness. The fact that your eye consciousness perceiving the tree has the tree appear to it And the fact that 
your eye consciousness knows the tree, is aware of the tree, is dependent on the immediately preceding condition. In other words, it's dependent on a preceding moment of awareness. And the fact that your eye consciousness perceives a visual object it's dependent on the uncommon dominant condition your eye sense faculty And the fact that this visual object appears as a tree and not as something else is dependent on the observed condition. A tree. So those three will perform the function of producing your eye consciousness that knows a tree. And while they are each producing or giving rise to the eye consciousness, the eye consciousness is arising. without existing yet. So think that with each condition or each cause, of your eye consciousness. There's the action of producing it and the action of its arising. But all this, though conventionally true, does not exist ultimately, is merely labeled
on the basis of different moments in time. Ever-changing moments. We label cause, effect, arising and producing. or if they weren't merely labeled. Giving rise to or arising would be impossible. Spend a moment just focusing single-pointedly on whatever conclusion, whatever insight you've gained. And allow for it to become a deeper part of your own mind. And then of course, let's dedicate all the virtue we've accumulated today. May this become the further cause for our own enlightenment, for our own awakening, for not just our own benefit, but for the benefit of each and every sentient being. Until we reach that state, may it also cause our great masters, like as whom as the Dalai Lama and all other great masters, to have an extremely long life and continue to guide us through their example and their teachings. And of course, may our virtue have a positive effect right here and right now on people around us. May I help those who are unwell, mentally, physically, like Geshe Pützok, Tali Lubin, and so many other living beings. May I help them to soon get better. And may I also help those greatly affected by environmental catastrophes such as fires and so forth to quickly overcome all their losses. So with this in mind, let's recite the prayer, the prayers. Through the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings, without exception, into that enlightened state. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chinrezik, Denzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. Oh.
All right. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'll see you again next week. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.